Synchronicity is one of those phenomena that people seem to be endlessly fascinated in. And I understand why. When a really compelling one happens to you, it's as if the laws of physics break. Or as I said in my last video, it's like a glitch in the matrix orchestrated just for you. Like some hidden hand set an impossible sequence of events in motion tailored just for your psyche. And in that same video, I did cover a lot of the basics about synchronicity, sticking closely to Jung's own explorations of it and interpretations of it. But I did shy away from some of the really big questions, like what really is synchronicity? What causes it? Can we construct a plausible, logical explanation for what synchronicity is? Can you, should you try to bring more synchronicity into your life? Well, my friends, now that I've come across some new information and I've really let it marinate and integrate for a while, I think we can answer those questions. But first, some quick review and context. What is synchronicity? It is a personally meaningful coincidence with no direct physical cause or connection, or as Jung called it, an a-causal connecting principle. Synchronicity means the simultaneous occurrence of psychic state with one or more external events, which appear as meaningful parallels to the momentary subjective state. But better than any rote definitions, let's look at some common examples. I'm sure almost all of you know what that spooky moment is like when you're listening to a song and just then you look up at a sign and you hear the same word and read the same word at that exact moment. In the song, the word that you're hearing shows up on a sign or a license plate in front of you. Or perhaps maybe you're thinking about a friend you haven't seen in quite some time and who texts you right then but that very same friend. But if we're honest with ourselves, of course we have to consider that maybe these simpler, more common kinds of synchronicity might be mere statistical aberrations, just coincidence. And that, in part, is why I love the really complex, multi-layered, rare variety of synchronicities, because there's so much more undeniable. They're so much harder to explain. These are synchronicities that might be tied to some underlying theme that may go on for days on end. You can hear a personal example that I experienced in this video here. And rather than sharing my own again, I wanted to share this absolutely brain-melting example from Jung, which he relays in his book, Synchronicity and a Causal Connecting Principle, the infamous fish synchronicity. Quote, on April 1st, 1949, I made a note in the morning of an inscription containing a figure that was half man, half fish. There was fish for lunch. Someone mentioned the custom of making an April fish of someone. In the afternoon, a former patient of mine, who I had not seen in months, showed me some impressive pictures of fish. In the evening, I was shown a piece of embroidery with sea monsters and fishes in it. The next morning, I saw a former patient who was visiting me for the first time in 10 years. She had dreamed of a large fish the night before. A few months later, when I was using this series for a larger work and had just finished writing it down, I walked over to a spot by the lake in front of the house where I had already been several times that morning this time, a fish a foot long lay on the seawall. Since no one else was present, I have no idea how the fish could have got there. What I love about this example is it's not only incredibly unlikely and multi-layered, it's dealing with a highly charged archetypal image, the image of the fish, which of course has existed throughout mystical traditions and religions for millennia. I'll speculate a little more on the relationship between archetypal images, and synchronicity later. So now that we've reestablished what synchronicity is, we come to our first irresistibly tantalizing, albeit very irresponsible question. How do synchronicities work? One of the very reasons synchronicities are so interesting is because they seem to violate the laws of physics. They seem to violate the laws of cause and effect. They seem to be non-local and instantaneous. For instance, either of those common examples of synchronicity from earlier, hearing the word in a song and seeing it at the same time, thinking about a friend and having them text you at the same time. There seems to be something both psychical and physical happening 
instantaneously. Something has to be transcending the boundaries of mind and matter of cause and effect. Is there anything like this that we know of? The answer is yes, and it's what's commonly referred to as quantum non-locality. And before I go here, two things. First, shout out to Dr. Justin Riddle and his amazing video on synchronicity. This is what sent me down this particular avenue of inquiry. You've got to check out his video on this topic too. And also, I'm always reluctant to explore anything having to do with the word quantum because it's one of those words that is often irresponsibly wielded as a placeholder for magic by people who don't know what the hell they're talking about. And by the way, I freely admit I'm not an expert on this topic. Even exploring quantum weirdness in this way would trigger a large majority of physicists probably. I'm sure right now Richard Dawkins is rolling around in bed muttering pseudoscience to himself, but that doesn't change the fact that multiple Nobel Prize winning scientists do consider the idea that there may be quantum phenomena involved in consciousness, and for our purposes may potentially provide a partial explanation for synchronicity. So with all of that qualification out of the way, one of the ideas at the core of this, which is widely accepted by the scientific mainstream, by the way, is what's known as quantum non-locality. The idea that phenomena can occur instantaneously across even vast amounts of space, that two things can impact one another even if they aren't causally connected. Usually this is experimentally demonstrated by entangling two photons and shooting them in opposite directions. Now on this note, one of the things that's really hard to wrap your mind around is that on the quantum level, these things like our photons don't really have any attributes until they're measured. So for the sake of this example, let's talk about spin. That's something you might measure in one of these experiments. Before these photons are measured, they don't have a spin. We don't know if their spin is up or down, and it's not even if it is up or down, it's not determined at all until it's measured. So we have our two photons flying apart. We don't know what their spin is. But here's the crazy thing. When you measure one photon and you find that its spin is up, the other photon's spin will instantaneously be the opposite. So if we measure one photon and its spin is up, the other one's is down. Again, this happens instantaneously once the measurement occurs, no matter what the distance. So this is what's meant by non-locality. There is no classical cause and effect occurring here. There is no information being transferred between the two photons. Measuring one instantaneously affects the other. Now, when all of this quantum weirdness was first theorized, it was a very big deal in the history of physics because it flew in the face of everything we thought we knew. I actually did a whole video on this topic if you want to do a deeper dive, but for our purposes, when Jung heard about this quantum weirdness, he couldn't help but think, perhaps this is part of the equation that we need to solve synchronicity. Perhaps this kind of quantum non-locality could be a piece to the synchronicity puzzle. And this is where our first Nobel Prize winning scientist comes into the picture, Wolfgang Pauli. Interestingly, he's not only a famous physicist, he was actually Jung's patient for a number of years. They did extensive dream work together, and even after that doctor-patient relationship ended, Pauli remained deeply interested in Jung's work, and he even helped him form and sculpt the theory of synchronicity. Much of their lengthy and dense correspondence actually took place over the course of years in the form of a lot of letters. You can actually read these letters now in the book Adam and Archetype. In those letters, Pauli and Jung tweet, clarified, and speculated about synchronicity and other topics at length, including the idea that perhaps there's some kind of quantum element involved in synchronicity, and that it might somehow explain the seeming physics-breaking bridging of the psychical and physical that we experience when we're having a synchronicity. In the words of Pauli, quote, To us, the only acceptable point of view appears to be the one that recognizes both sides of reality, 
the quantitative and the qualitative, the physical and the psychical, as compatible with each other. It would be most satisfactory of all if physics and psyche, i.e. mind and matter, could be seen as complementary aspects of the same reality. There's a lot of interesting multidisciplinary speculation in this correspondence between Jung and Pauli, and of course they don't produce any smoking gun. They don't give any final explanation of how synchronicity is really occurring, especially not that they can demonstrate. But through a combination of the speculation we've already done, this link that's established by Pauli and Jung, we can propose a basic overarching scenario. And what would that look like? Well, similar to our two particles that are shot in opposite directions that are entangled, imagine you have two things that are entangled in our world, perhaps some quantum process in your mind with something in the outside world. Perhaps the subjective experience of that entanglement results in what we would call a synchronicity, or at least has a role to play in what we would call a synchronicity. Maybe that quantum element crosses that psychoid bridge, that psychophysical bridge that we can't make sense of. This is where two brilliant contemporary scientists, Dr. Stuart Hammerov and our second Nobel Prize winning physicist, Roger Penrose, come into the picture. Because they're actually working on a theory of quantum consciousness. Now, I don't want to get too deep into what this theory entails because it would require me introducing a whole bunch of new concepts like microtubules, and I don't think that's worth it for the purposes of this video. We'll just leave it at that I think this is the sort of spiritual successor to the work that Jung and Pauli were doing, trying to connect quantum processes to consciousness. But it is important to introduce it for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's a plausible and potentially falsifiable successor to some of these ideas that Jung and Pauli were playing with. And two, because Roger Penrose is very important to this conversation of synchronicity for another reason. And what is that reason? Well, I think Penrose points to the thing that really brings this whole equation together, an invisible realm. And it's where our ability to make sense of reality comes from in the first place. And if this sounds far-fetched, as Roger Penrose puts it in his book, Shadows of the Mind, this realm is a logical inevitability. When we understand something, what's happening? You might be thinking to yourself, well, we logically go through a problem or gradually acquire a skill or knowledge until we arrive at understanding. And this is sort of an iterative process that just keeps going on and on throughout our lives. And yes, this is pretty much the empirical mechanistic view of reality. You go out there and you interact with stuff and you gain experience and knowledge. But if you think about it a little more deeply, and I would even say, basically, that doesn't really answer the question. The question is, what is understanding? Why is it that something clicks and we know it? It's as if something snaps into place right where it belongs. This is especially true and straightforward to see when it comes to math and logic. Once, for instance, you discover that 2 times 2 equals 4, it's over. There's no debate. It's self-evidently true, and by logical extension, all of the constituent parts of that statement are true in and of themselves, too. And by two, I mean also, not the number two, even though we're talking about two. But anyway, this feature of reality, of understanding in and of itself, has long been a topic of fascination for Roger Penrose, and he explores it at length in his books, The Emperor's New Mind and Shadows of the Mind. And to fully spell this out, I'm talking about the phenomenon of their being understanding, of their being sense, structure, and logic at all is hugely important because it leads us to this logical inevitability I mentioned earlier. That the sense we locate through the utilization of logic and math is not ours. It actually exists a priori of our brains. It actually exists in a realm somewhere out there. To use the same example, two times two would still equal four, whether or not your brain or anyone else's brain 
existed. Clearly the laws of physics must have existed before human beings discovered them and labeled them, right? And by the way, don't confuse the notation of two, the way that we write two for the actual concept of two. So to sum this up and get to the punchline and tie it back into synchronicity, Penrose believes that while the brain and the processes going on in it are important, they don't in and of themselves explain the phenomenon of understanding or why we are able to understand things in the first place. Rather, we discover or we contact that a priori, that pre-existent sense that really exists in another realm through our rational process. So Penrose believes that the mathematical rules that underpin reality really exist in some unseen realm, and he openly equates that realm with the platonic realm of forms. As Penrose says in Shadows of the Mind, quote, somehow the very world of physical reality seems to emerge of the platonic world of mathematics. And Penrose makes clear this is not just a concept, this is something that he takes seriously. He believes this transcendent realm of forms is what underpins reality. And he even posits that it's primary, that it's somehow superior to the physical world and to the mental world. And I've kind of backed into the explanation of the platonic realm of forms here. This is an idea that was proposed by the ancient philosopher Plato that Penrose finds to really describe reality. And this idea is essentially that there is this realm of forms and sense and universal concepts that we are all tapped into. And this is why we can share ideas. This is why we can arrive at mathematical truth. This is why we can make sense of the world. And for related reasons, Penrose believes that there must be something about consciousness that must lay beyond the computational processes of the brain. So he often talks about an element of consciousness that's quote unquote non-computational, that can't be captured in any kind of computational or neurological scheme. So this leads us to really the final piece of this argument. And this final piece is Roger Penrose's view of reality, a three part reality. And I think this model provides a plausible, clear route by which synchronicity might occur. So what is this three part triangular reality? Luckily, in principle, it's simple. You're already familiar with all three parts. One part is the platonic realm of forms, one is the physical world, and one is the mental. So how exactly does this potentially make synchronicity make sense? Well, if this realm of higher order of forms of mathematics does exist, as Penrose posits, and our consciousness is somehow connected to it, and likewise is the physical world, now suddenly we have all three ingredients for synchronicity. We have sense and understanding itself, which comes from the realm of forms. We have the phenomenon in the outside physical world, and we have the realm of our own subjective experience. So if we plug Penrose's three world hypothesis into the phenomenon of synchronicity, we can say that perhaps a synchronicity is the harmony of all three worlds. It's some kind of non-local sense coming from the platonic realm of forms and existing simultaneously in our own psychical world and in the physical world. And this is what gives that sense of reality breaking non-locality. So just to unpack this one more time, if Penrose and really all of the Platonists throughout the ages are right, and there is this transcendent realm of platonic forms projecting mathematical sense and rules and order down into the physical world, and that world is being translated by our minds, which in turn have rational access to the realm of forms through being rationally rigorous, or what Plato would call our logos, this really completes our psychoid connection, this psychophysical circuit that Jung was looking for. 
For more on the soul slash psyche, according to Plato, check out this video. I do touch on this concept of logos if you're curious about that. So this completes our picture, but there's some dubious speculation I want to engage in, and there are some questions that go along with it that we haven't answered yet. Namely, can you and should you try to bring more synchronicity into your life? There are a couple of ways to address this and to look at this, but I'm going to go with the one that I think I like best and also fits in with what we've already discussed. If you are actively using that higher part of your psyche, your logos, to interact with those higher realms, like let's say Roger Penrose might have been or Jung might have been, it would make sense that perhaps you would see connections more readily. Perhaps you would see synchronicities more regularly. You'd be aware of more interconnection and correspondence and sympathy between phenomena. And this is where the speculation gets very dubious. I don't think this applies to just mathematics. I think this applies to all kinds of psychic phenomena, especially archetypes. And as I already covered in another video, Jung himself likened archetypes to the Platonic realm of forms. Quote, archetype is an explanatory paraphrase of the Platonic eidos. And he also defines archetypes as active living dispositions, ideas in the Platonic sense that perform and continually influence our thoughts, feelings, and actions. So perhaps this explains why if you're researching an archetype as Jung was researching the archetype of fish, he suddenly unleashed all of these synchronicities. Because as his psyche approached closer to that archetype, all of these other sort of psychophysical relationships between him and that archetype started to emerge in the form of that fish synchronicity. I can't help but wonder if perhaps this is an example of what the ancients called sympathy or sympatheia in Greek, a kind of hidden correspondence between archetypal forces and objects here in our realm and in higher realms, or to put it in a way that you're probably already more familiar with, as above, so below. There's some kind of correspondence between higher and lower forms, and we can tap into that correspondence if we sharpen our psyches enough, or do the right rituals, or have the right realizations. Of course, in a modern sense, this idea would be totally dismissed as pseudoscience, but this way of thinking was prevalent in the ancient Hellenistic world, later among alchemists and mystics. So I think it's a circumstantial, but still compelling and hard to ignore potential element of synchronicity. And just after recording this, I tried to search for an example of Jung talking about this, and of course I found it. The normal interpretation of synchronicity, as far as this is possible at all, is based on the philosophic premise of the sympathy of all things, or something of that kind. But anyway, sympathy or this kind of as above, so below correspondence is really taking us deep into the realm of speculation and the intuitive and the dubious. It's a deep topic in its own right, one that I'm sure I won't be able to resist returning to in future transmissions. And the final question I promised I would get to should you try to bring more synchronicity into your life? Well, like any good question, the answer to that depends, I think. Jung was clear that in some cases, synchronicity was the forerunner of cataclysm. That when bad things were about to happen, all kinds of symbolic coincidences would emerge. On that note, there's one example I want to share, but it's rather dark and I have a feeling the Elgo will not appreciate it. And this one's getting really long, so I'm just going to link it in the description below. Jung also makes it clear that too much synchronicity is not necessarily a good thing. Yes, he says that it's an ever-present reality, but he also makes it clear that it can borderline on pathology. Quote, the schizophrenic's interpretation of synchronicity is morbidly narrow because it is mostly restricted to the intentions of other people and to his own ego importance. However, if you're seeing increased synchronicity in your studies, 
like Jung was, or you're really trying to put in the work and follow your intuition and what the whisper of your conscience is telling you to do, and you're honing your intuition, and this isn't just wishful thinking, then I think, yes, I think synchronicities can be a kind of evidence of higher order. So I do think there's a lot of nuance necessary in trying to answer that question. I do think it's easy to go overboard with synchronicity. So I think this is case by case territory. I think we need to exercise critical thinking. We need to learn to discern between our intuitions and our bias. Uh, I would not dare to make any final proclamations on this topic. But what do you think, my fellow Wonder Knots? Not just about that bit, but everything we've worked our way through in this video. Does the quantum angle coupled with the platonic realm of forms and Penrose's three worlds, does this provide a satisfying potential architecture by which synchronicity occurs? Not just synchronicity, but does it paint a compelling picture of reality for you? Let me know in the comments. Check out some of my other videos on Jungian and Platonic milieu on the channel. And again, I cannot recommend Justin Riddle's video on synchronicity enough. That will be linked in the description as well. I would be ever so grateful if you tickled that algorithm with a like, a sub, a comment, a share. All of it is supremely helpful. And with that, my friends, much love, and I will see you in the next transmission.